This episode is sponsored by NordPass. SpaceX, Starship Updates and Spitzer Space Telescope says goodbye. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? And as always there has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates If you watch my episodes on a regular basis, you know that this week was a very special one for SpaceX indeed. Not only did they launch their next 60 Starlink satellites, they also got done with the test tanks and they are now in the first early stages of building that next generation Starship hull. These are the first pictures of a growing starship. Still in its infancy it will soon tower over Boca Chica and hopefully not long after that take to the skies and chart the first flight miles for starships in human history. If the project succeeds, future generations will look at this in the same way we look at the Apollo program. Starship will revolutionize our access to space, making it available for the average person. The next major task ahead for the SpaceX team in Boca Chica is the so-called primary hull structure. This includes everything from the nose cone over the header tanks to main locks and methane tanks and also the canard fins and the large aft fins. We saw all this already from the outside last fall with Starship Mark 1. It wasn't refined enough to be able to launch. It is very likely that Starship Serial No. 2 will look similar to Mark 1 with a few changes. Musk already stated that Serial No. 1's flight design differs from Mark 1's appearance. In what way is hard to say at the moment, but one thing will change for sure. The dents will largely disappear and the welds will be far less and also less visible. Starship is maturing and SpaceX seems to make very good progress. The remains of the second 9 meter test article are being removed from the pad and transported to the scrapyard. It won't be long before we should see SpaceX flesh out the launch mount for the next Starship. My hope is that SpaceX will build something similar to the launch mount at Pad 39A in Florida. This would first of all be a permanent launch mount and not an improvised solution as we saw for Mark 1 and secondly it would be yet another signal from SpaceX that they intend to see this through. There are still a lot of people out there having doubt in SpaceX's seriousness to see this project become a success. Largely fueled by the failures created by Mark 1 and a Starship seemingly built only as a presentation prop. The next one will have to show what it can do. Otherwise many who are not diehard Starship fans might lose even more faith. I'll definitely watch the progress though no matter what happens next as many of you will do as well for sure. Starship is just too important for a future in space to lose faith quickly. The Windbreaker No. 2 seems to be almost finished on the outside and one thing becomes more and more apparent. It has quite the different form factor compared to the other Windbreaker. This could have multiple possible reasons. One of them of course being that it will serve a slightly different purpose. It might be more of a construction facility for large parts and the larger Windbreaker might be the actual vertical assembly building. So in the smallest tents SpaceX will create the delicate parts. Small structures, internal parts and maybe even work on engine preparation. In the Onion tent SpaceX would then assemble ring segments of stacks of up to roughly 5 rings. This includes tanks pre-built for stacking like they did with the test tanks. These then would be stacked to larger segments in the second windbreaker or construction facility. And when work is done on these large parts SpaceX would then transfer them to the windbreaker number one or vertical assembly building for stacking and final integration. This would be an assembly line similar to what the car manufacturing industry uses with the exception that the Starship wouldn't constantly move on a belt of course. It would make much sense for SpaceX to take this approach as well as the plan is to build many of these prototypes in quick succession and after the prototype phase which includes figuring out the build process many many more. Different manufacturing industries have already proven in the last century that rotating stations along a construction line speed up the process immensely as you can specialize the workers for specific tasks along the manufacturing line. It would also be a very typical approach for Elon Musk. Think outside the box and try to integrate already proven techniques into a new engineering field. No rocket has ever been built on an assembly line. Musk stated numerous times though that he wants to build at least a thousand starships. This would dwarf any existing rocket family by numbers. For example the Soyuz rocket family, the most launched rocket family in the world went through four different generations already and was built more than 140 times so far. 
No doubt a very impressive achievement. The Falcon 9 boosters get up to a total of 67 if you count in all the prototypes as well. And this would be since 2007. That's 13 years for 67 boosters and a bit over 5 per year on average. Even if we take the numbers from 2019, where Block 5 was in full production, we get to only 8 boosters for the year. At this speed, it would take SpaceX roughly 125 years to build 1000 Starships. So it's safe to say and not a speculation that SpaceX will have to do something different if they want to achieve these numbers. Yet again, they will have to come up with a new and different solution. We'll just have to find out what they're planning and a possible solution would be the mentioned assembly line. Think of it as a mass production rocket factory when you look at Boca Chica, for that's what it needs to become if SpaceX wants to make the proposed Mars colony a reality. According to Musk, Starships will have to leave the buildings at a speed of 100 per year, accounting for an accumulated yield of 1 megaton of payload to orbit per year. And for those not familiar with the term megaton, that's 100,000 tons of cargo to LEO per year. To achieve this number, Boca Chica will have to become nothing more than the pumping heart of the global space industry. Keep that in mind when you see these pictures of a growing scrapyard as it's called by many. Spitzer Space Telescope says goodbye. On January 30th, a groundbreaking NASA mission ended without much applause. So I picked this second news topic to raise some more awareness about what actually happened on January 30th and how significant this inconspicuous little metal tube actually was. The Spitzer Space Telescope, launched on August 25th of 2003 on board a Delta II rocket out of Space Launch Complex 17B at Cape Canaveral, was not watched by many at the time. It wasn't big enough to draw the attention it would have deserved. I'll take you on a little journey today and show you what some very smart scientists can do with a small metal tube and the right ideas. It entered service in December of the same year after it had successfully deployed into its target orbit. And this is already where the ingenuity of the mission starts to unfold. Spitzer got injected into a so-called Earth trailing orbit. This means that it follows the same path as Earth does around the Sun. Positioned outside of the infrared influence of Earth and Moon, it slowly creeped away from us in the last 17 years. So one of the difficulties of the mission was to keep in contact with a telescope that constantly increased distance from Earth over the mission duration. Spitzer was one of those missions to utilize NASA's Deep Space Network for communication. For those who do not know, the Deep Space Network currently consists of three large Earth-based radio telescopes. Located roughly at 120 degrees from each other in the United States, Australia and Spain. This ensures communication with spacecrafts far away from Earth and around the clock. Spitzer was placed so far away to reduce infrared heat interference. The main task of Spitzer was to do infrared observation of distant objects. When you place an infrared telescope on our home world surface or even in a low orbit around it, there are immense interferences from local infrared radiation. Imagine it like looking up into the sky at night while standing next to a floodlight. Spitzer though did not need much cooling aside from a heat shield and very little liquid helium cooling to be kept at around 4 Kelvin or roughly 270 degrees Celsius. At these temperatures there is almost no interfering IR radiation, giving a telescope a very clear view comparable to an absolute pitch black night without a moon to stay in the night sky analogy. This enabled Spitzer to achieve greatness. It pushed the boundaries of what we know about the universe and gave us insights into the distant past. The biggest benefit of an infrared telescope is that it's comparable to an X-ray machine when it comes to astronomy. Where Hubble, for example, takes beautiful pictures of the outside of a nebula or galaxy, Spitzer was able to look inside, as infrared radiation is not nearly as much blocked by dust particles. The problem is that most objects out there that are interesting involve a lot of dust and gas. Spitzer was able to look inside galaxies. It was able to take pictures of star systems in their infancy, sending us pictures of forming planets in stellar accretion disks. It gave us insights into the behavior of organic material that is millions of light years away from Earth. In 2005, the Spitzer Space Telescope became the first telescope to directly observe the light emitted by an exoplanet. In this case, the two hot Jupiter-class planets HD 209458b and TRES-1b. 
This was the first time extrasolar planets had actually been visually seen. In 2004, Spitzer found the youngest star to be currently known in the universe. A faint glow of an early star collecting gas from a nearby nebula. I could go on with this list forever and it is a perfect example of the short length of my episodes. But I hope I was able to show you that Spitzer was not as insignificant as it may have been perceived by the general public. Spitzer was remarkable and it gave us a look at what its successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, might be able to achieve. Where Spitzer only had its small 0.85 meter diameter mirror to achieve all these goals, James Webb will utilize its massive 6.5 meter segmented mirror to go further than we can currently imagine. Why is SpaceX testing so much? Because they have to demonstrate that starships have to be reliable many times in a row. They know that safety is a very important part of what they're doing. Do you know too? How about your personal approach to safety? Today's sponsor could be the solution you're looking for when it comes to organizing and improving your own online security. Have you ever clicked on this? Or this? How about this one? Don't feel bad. You're just like most other online users. You keep your passwords in your head. Probably short ones you can easily remember, right? Well, most of the time, of course. How about changing that once and for all with a reliable and versatile password manager? NordPass is a new generation password manager where security meets simplicity. It's made by the same experts who are already trusted by over 12 million online users. NordVPN. With the click of a button, you get a centralized locker for passwords so strong you couldn't possibly keep them in your head. On top of that, the service is available no matter where you go, on your PC, tablet or phone. Never do a password recovery again and at the same time support What About It. Get 50% off NordPass at nordpass.com slash whataboutit or use the code whataboutit. It's only $2.49 per month and you get one additional month for free. So break with old habits with NordPass, link is in the description. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? How will SpaceX produce 1000 starships? And did you know that Spitzer was so significant for our understanding of the universe? As always, tell me in the comments. And we're at the patron shoutout again, where I show some love for those who go above and beyond when it comes to supporting me and the channel. These people pay money for something that is completely for free. They give vital revenue into the production and they enable me to buy pretty much all the equipment I use. The microphone, the camera, even the monitor I'm gonna edit on later after I record it is funded by the patrons. So show some love in the comments and maybe even consider becoming one yourself. And as always, we have new members on the team. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Matthew Riddick Boylan, S. Ludwig, Henrik Torphammer, David Cobb and many others. You rock! Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? And now would be the appropriate time to hit the like button, subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell button to actually receive a notification when I do my uploads. It's a version of support that doesn't cost a penny and it does help me to produce more and better content. And if you do want to spend your money, consider becoming a patron and get insights into the production of What About It? and chat with me on the Discord. Or you could buy yourself a new shirt on our merchandise store and look like me. There are plenty original designs available in good quality for a low price made by a space nerd for other space nerds. It all helps me to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. So this wraps up today's episode of What About... Yay, yay! <laughs> 1000 nyuk nyuk. To achieve this number, Boca Chica will have to become nothing less than the global pumping heart of a freaking sentence. Spitzer Space Telescope. Diamant. Tamatebla. <laughs>